I, I can understand that this is a world view that's very different from a conventional Western world view of most of the, the people in our audience now, but I, I do know that anthropologists are almost universal in uh, d discovering and reporting unusual psychic experiences, telepathic experiences being very common and of, of a verifiable nature among the Aborigines. And it, it suggests to me that their sense of the dream time may be related to, to their psychic awakening. Well, it's very clear <coughs> that their sense of aliveness, their sense of awareness, is very, very different from our sense of aliveness and awareness. Uh, uh, when Aborigines first came in contact with white people, for example, they thought they were seeing ghosts of their ancestors. They assumed we were dead. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, I don't think they've ever gotten over that concept. <laughs> I think we are still somewhat weird or, or dead-like spirits to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so their concept of life in general is very different. So what they think is magical or what they think is possible versus what we think is magical and possible are quite different. So it's not, it's very normal, mm -hmm. for example, for Aboriginal people to be in contact with each other over hundreds and hundreds of miles without any seemingly electronic means or medium by which mm -hmm. that contact can be made. Mm -hmm. I spent time with a man who I'll call Arthur, uh, a full-blooded Aboriginal, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, showing me about various parts of his culture. He even gave me a, a, a name, a skin name, so that when I wandered into various tribal situations, I could identify myself to people so they knew how they were to, how they were to relate to me. They gave me a skin name. It was called Jangula, which there, there are many different skin names. Skin names are used to differentiate people so that they don't intermarry or produce mm. the, the wrong factors. It's mathematically impossible by the skin name labeling to be any closer than a cousin who's one over, mm -hmm. one over 30 seconds removed by blood from, from your actual family line. At any rate, uh, Arthur would, uh, sp would not sleep in the house, for example. He would sleep outside. Um, there would be animals that would appear when Arthur was around, and when they did appear, Arthur would know immediately what tribal member or family member needed some care or some particular consideration. He would then, via the animal, in some way communicate that, and that message would be instantly communicated. People told me after Arthur's visit that they had seen Arthur 500 miles away in another situation entirely, which mm -hmm. was, we would say, physically impossible. Mm -hmm. But somehow the idea of projection, or as the Buddhists talk about, tulpoidal imagery was created in this uh, other aspect. And now this is where it ties in with, I think, UFO phenomena. Uh, we're today in a cultural crisis dealing with what I would say dream material manifesting in our actual lives, in our real lives. Now, now let's just go back a sure. second. You used the term tulpoidal yes. phenomenon. Yes. You associated that with the Tibetans. Yes. Uh, I know uh, in Alexandra David Neal's uh, exactly. studies of her travels in Tibet back in the 1920s and 30s, she, she described this, and perhaps for the, the sake of our audience, you might elaborate on the term tulpa or tulpoidal phenomena. Well, um, this is a, a technique. Uh, now, I have to tell you that I'm not an expert in this, so you'll have to forgive me if mm -hmm. I make mistakes about this. But as I understand it, uh, this is a technique uh, used by Tibetan Buddhists and maybe other Buddhist uh, sects uh, to, uh, first of all, create an image of something which doesn't exist in the physical world. A mental image. A mental image. To meditate upon that image uh, on, a, on a regular basis as a regular part of their daily meditation routine. To meditate on it so strongly that other people meditating in their presence without knowing what the image is that they're meditating on begin to see the same image. Mm -hmm. When a number of people begin to see that image, then something seems to happen, which uh, sounds impossible to any, any rational Western mind. The object of which the image is being thought about begins to appear in the same room or space that the uh, uh, imagers are, are thinking about. Uh, there are stories which indicate that some images became so real that even after the person who was imagining the image died, the image still persisted. Mm -hmm. So whether the image is a real object, say is this, uh, uh, there's this vase on the table, or whether it's an object created mm -hmm. by mind, it's very difficult to say at this point because, uh, because I think 
uh, from what I understand, the image became so real that they could actually reach out and touch it, and it would feel mm -hmm. to them as or just as mm -hmm. this object feels real to my fingers. Alexandra David Neal, as I recall, described this tulpa becoming a, a personality, a person, and other mm -hmm. people would see it, and it eventually became autonomous and, and rather cantankerous, and exactly. she lost complete control over it. Exactly. Um, I would say it's a kind of a psychic Ouija board effect, if you <laughs> want to use that term. Uh, many minds are involved, and there's some, I mean, first of all, we have to, now we're getting into some definitions of mind and consciousness. <clears throat> is consciousness an airtight thing contained within the framework of each of our bodies? Or is consciousness something that exists outside of the body, in which the body encompasses parts of it, mm -hmm. sort of like bubbles encompass the air in, the, yeah. in a great ocean of some sort. Mm -hmm. If we assume that consciousness exists per se, then there may be some amplification or magnification effect when two or more individuals mm -hmm. begin to meditate or to contemplate or visualize the same imagery. And I think that's what is going on here. She lost control because other beings were other presences, other humans, mm -hmm. possibly even other spiritual presences, were using the same image. Now all of this suggests, to come back to the, our topic of dreaming, that our waking life in, in some aspects is not so different from a dream. Yes, um, this now begins to border <coughs> into what is the edge which separates <laughs> the image reality of our dream life from the so-called physical reality of the real world. And at this point, when I begin to study that with the eye of the quantum physicist, which is, of course, my training, then I begin to see a, a, a way in which there is an overlap. First of all, there's this, this idea in quantum physics that everything is made of probability. Well, probability is mind stuff. And yet, out of probability, actualities manifest. This is what quantum physics basically says. So if matter is nothing more than probability manifesting as an object, then is this, somewhat, is this, is this process somewhat akin to the type of processing that the Tibetan Buddhists are using or that the Aboriginal mm -hmm. uh, tribal people are using, etc. I mm -hmm. think there's a clear link that it, that it mm -hmm. is, that they are the same process. However, we've been trained to look at it slightly mm -hmm. differently so we don't see it in the same light that they do. In a while back, you suggested that there's some sort of a relationship between UFO experiences and all of this. I believe that in times of great crises, and I think we are in a time of crises right now, although it may not appear <coughs> to be one, but there's, an, uh, there's an, uh, uh, a, a crisis of survival, there's a crisis of hunger, there's a crisis of, of, of uh, people losing their jobs, say in our country, there's a crisis of, of what's going on in Russia, there's crises, you know, crises are occurring all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's still spiritual crises taking place in, 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 in most of the major parts of the world. Uh, when that happens, I believe that the collective unconscious does manifest in our dreams and that our personal dreams, the dreams that we have that we think are just, oh, this is my, geez, I just dreamt about my, my daily residue stuff that came up for me and it's really just my, my stuff that I got to handle. That the stuff that you have to handle as a person is a reflection of the stuff that the planet, the planetary life, the consciousness of the planet has to handle. And that my little dream may be a, just a, we might say a holographic piece of the bigger dream. Mm -hmm.